Greetings. I'm Erica James, Dean of the Wharton School. Welcome to Beyond Business. Our session today is called Race and the Selling of America, where we will explore industry, how industries are recon reconciling their complicated history with marketing brands through Black culture, and why now is the perfect time for Black influencers to use their voice to incite meaningful change. Today's panelists will discuss how brands can work with the Black culture in a way that benefits both companies and the Black community at large. Beyond Business is an ongoing conversation that explores the most complex and pressing issues impacting individuals and organizations across the world. Our first three-part series shines a light on how systemic racism impacts business and society as a whole and ways it can be confronted. Beyond Business is part of the Tarnapal Lecture Series, which is named for Mickey Tarnapal, Wharton graduate from the class of 1958 and his wife, Lynn. Mr. Tarnapal was a global business leader and served as vice chairman of the International Banking Division of Bear Stearns and & Company. And he was an avid member of both the Wharton and Penn communities. I'm thrilled to be joined today by three remarkable guests. Philip Sun, president, managing partner, and co-founder of M88, a representation firm amplifying the voices of artists and creators. Kirk Morrison, football analyst and former NFL linebacker. And my Wharton colleague, Professor Americus Reed, who will be our Q&A moderator for today's discussion. Just so you're aware, conversation will begin with our featured speakers, both Philip and Kirk, followed by the Q&A facilitated by Professor Reed. Those of you in the audience, feel free to submit questions for either of our panelists at any point throughout our discussion. Professor Reed will be monitoring the chat throughout the event and will be sure to raise your questions with our panelists as soon as we get to the Q&A moderation. So with that, welcome Philip and Kirk. Glad to have you with us. Thanks for having and us. Kirk, I want to start with you. You began your career as an NFL linebacker for the Oakland Raiders in 2005, and now you're co-host of Forward Progress, a serious XM program that explores the intersection of sports and racial equity in America. What events or experiences led you to want to lend your voice to this important issue? Wow, it's a great question. Uh, first of all, thank you again for having me, uh, Dean James. Uh, it's a privilege to be here to join you guys, but um, I think I wanted to lend my voice for many different reasons. I think because, like you mentioned, um, I was a former player, came into the NFL in 2005, and it was a time in which, uh, you know, voices really weren't heard by players, right? Your job as an NFL player was to go out and do your job. And if you didn't do it or you did things outside of the realm, it was kind of a situation where a lot of people or a lot of players felt that you were easily replaced. And if you're easily replaced, um, that means that, you know what, I'll probably just be quiet. But I think uh, I'll go to, I think this uh, Memorial weekend, this past Memorial weekend, 2020, Memorial Day weekend, I think changed for a lot of people in our country um, because of, uh, George Floyd and the murder of George Floyd and everybody saw what happened. It became, it became an awakening, I think, for a lot of people outside of the sports world, but within the sports, sports world, it was something in which a lot of athletes who look like me, we'd seen in our neighborhoods or we're constantly in fear of, which is the police. And we saw protests, we saw marches, we saw uh, people's reacting. And for myself, not only was there forms of protest, but how do I, what else could I use to get the message across or for people to hear the message or listen? It, it was lending my voice, finding a platform. And my platform, i um, very lucky that and, and blessed that Sirius XM had a platform for us to talk about these issues with race, equality, gender, all of that, everything that we've been seeing over the last four to five months, I call it the awakening, but that's what kind of led me to 
say, you know what, I want to use my voice in a different way. Um, the NFL, the sport in which that I've played, is the most watched sport in North America. Everyone watches the NFL. But I think there's also a lot of players who wanted to lend their voice but didn't have the avenue. They didn't have the platform. And so that's what I tried to do is give people, players, former players, executives, coaches, a, a platform to use your voice. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to jump into this this world of broadcasting and, and getting the message across. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've known, uh, that I've done so far in 2020. Thanks for sharing that. And Philip, relatedly, in August, you launched your agency M88 to promote non-white talent, including actors, writers, directors, and producers. Prior to that, you were a partner at one of Hollywood's biggest agencies, William Morris Endeavor, where you represented artists including Michael B. Jordan, Idris Alba, Naomi Scott, and Rihanna. What motivated you to leave your successful career at such an institution to launch your venture? Uh, well, I think, you know, again, like Kirk said, thank you, Dean James, for having us. Um, you know, it's, it's an honor to speak to everyone here. Uh, what motivated me was, you know, the agency, the Hollywood industry and the systems that, you know, have existed. Uh, let's speak specifically about the agencies are they're phenomenal. They're they're a perfect marketing machine, but they also have limitations as far as uh, the ability to evolve as far as inclusion and diversity goes. And, you know, my partners there, we've always worked on promoting actors of color, talent of color, uh, creators of color. Um, and, you know, we pushed hard and as far as I felt that we could go within an institution that was built, um, not for people necessarily that look like us. Um, so, you know, with the birth of my son in December, uh, my perspective completely changed. Obviously with COVID for the first time in 15 years, it gave me a chance to actually pause and think about what the next, you know, 10 years of my life would look like. Um, and I felt that, you know, I had done everything that I felt like I could do at the agency in, in order to push inclusivity and diversity there. Um, and the opportunity to join with my mentor, Charles King, who had started Macro, uh, a production company studio that promotes multicultural content, um, to start the representation arm felt like the perfect fit. Um, and through M88, it was time to kind of build a representation firm that was black owned, minority led, um, and, and built on the principles that we'd have been pushing within the system. Um, it just got a little bit tiresome feeling like diversity and inclusion was, you know, a policy or a program or an afterthought or a reaction. Um, we really wanted to build a firm that had those principles at the core so you don't have to push for them. They're just there. They exist. Um, and we all know through companies and corporations, when you build the culture and the mission at the very beginning, it travels through for the, the lifespan of the company. So um, it just felt with all of those variables, it was time to to build it. Well, we certainly know that you're doing, both of you are doing remarkable and really pleased for your leadership in, in really important industries. This question is for both of you. And Philip, since you just had the floor, I'll start with you. Brands across the board are responding to the Black Lives Matter movement and the cultural significance of the murder of George Floyd, Kirk, as you mentioned. What kind of responses are you seeing within your own industries? And do you believe that those actions are largely symbolic or will they actually create long lasting or meaningful change? I think I think that the well, I'd like to think that the industry itself is trying to better itself. Um, the the agendas and the initiatives for diversity and inclusion have been slowly, you know, infiltrating the normal system, if you will. Um, I think you felt it most during Oscar So White a few years back um, and kind of. Anytime there's a, a spotlight on just how um, non-inclusive any industry is, uh, companies tend to react. Unfortunately, um, you know, obviously with George Floyd being one of so many tragic losses, I think that moment in time met with COVID when, when there is nothing that could distract us for how tragic it was and how 
unfair the, the playing field is. I think that just added f- fuel to the flame of a very slowly burning flame in mm-hmm. my industry. Um, and people reacted and people reacted in the right way. Um, it just, it felt like it took a massive jump forward. Um, and I think that's part of the reason too that we started M88 was to make sure that there's an organization to also hold them accountable, right? So it is one thing to to be symbolic. It is another, um, if there are people holding you accountable for what you're saying, not for as a reaction and to get good press, but to actually practice it. Um, and as any company does at an institution, it's about the bottom line and the power of the creator of color, um, the actor of color, the person of color within our industry is so profound now um, that we we were lucky enough to gather a critical mass um, across the industry to put everyone's feet to the fire and hold them there. Um, and we'll continue to lead in. So I don't think it's, it certainly may start as symbolic, um, but anytime you have an opportunity like that from the other side, you hold them to it. Um, and that's what we're really trying to do now. And Kirk, what about for the NFL? I think the NFL is making a uh, great change. Um, I think the responses that we're seeing is that the NFL is listening, where I think as before, uh, probably listen, but not as a, as focused as they should have. Um, I know with my employers, SiriusXM and ESPN, they have definitely gone above probably what they've done in years past. Um, we've seen the, I think ESPN even last week, we saw them highlight on Monday Night Football that it was an all black officiating crew and, and showing the diversity in which the NFL has. Uh, I know myself as a broadcaster uh, in the football game, I just broadcast it last week. Uh, the University of Washington, Washington has a black head coach in Jimmy Lake. He's the fifth black head coach in the Pac-12 conference. And, and at times I felt that maybe before it would that it wouldn't be something that you would highlight in a football game. It's stick to what's on the field, stick to the sport, stick to the game. But I thought that that was something that you should highlight. And you're starting to see that now to talk about some of the accomplishments that are happening right there in sports. Um, I also see this is that we're seeing responses and I think it's going to be for good. But I think a lot of it, it's more for the next generation. I think for myself, I know as a parent, we're always working to help out and make things better for the people who come after us because we may not see immediate change now, right? You're seeing the, the, the framework, but it won't happen right away. You're seeing what may happen in years to come in the future that will be much better for the next generation now to, to dream big, to look and see people of color in different aspects and saying, wow, I can now look to be an official. I can be a coach. Um, I can be an executive. I can be the vice president or the president of the United States. It's now more about setting that framework for allowing the next generation to dream big. And I think that's what a lot of companies are starting to realize is that the awakening, you know, sort of what Philip said, like the awakening of what happened with George Floyd came at the perfect time. It was the perfect time because we all had nowhere to go. We all were on lockdown and we couldn't turn the channel. We had to leave the channel right there. We had to leave it on and watch what was going on in our country, in our neighborhoods, where we live. And some people were shocked. I remember getting phone calls and um, you know messages, emails from my colleagues and said, you know what? I've been so caught up in so, so much in my own bubble that I didn't realize what's going on in other communities. And so that's where I think now a lot of people are saying, how do we figure this out? Like, how do we make this change? And that's what I think it's about now. It's making that change for the future. And now the next generation can come in definitely much better than the way we came in. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing that. Uh, Philip, in a recent interview with the LA Times, you said that Hollywood's systems are just old and they need adapting to the new world order. 
So first of all, what is that new world order in your mind? And then how do you characterize it, uh, the, the role that you see yourself playing on the talent and with the talent on your rosters? I, I think the, the new world, I, I, I love that I use that. Um, <laughs> it was you know, the new world order in, in my mind um, right. is really the acknowledgement um, you know, in our business of everyone says that minority led companies are niche, right? Mm-hmm. Like right. represent uh, people of color, it's niche. It's, you know, like it's very specific. Right. However, we represent the global majority. The numbers are the numbers. Numbers are always right. numbers. You know, mm-hmm. as, as, a, as the dean of the business school, numbers don't lie, right? right. <laughs> so it, it becomes, uh, becomes funny to me when people are like, oh, it's niche, when the new world order is actually the majority of the world looks diverse, is diverse, right? And it, the acknowledgement of that. And I think that for, at least in my generation, the first time, we're, we're using that superpower. We, we know that we're here. We have voices that are amplifying us. You're starting to see us more on, in my industry, on screen, on podcasts, right? On, like, right. Everywhere, on content, in content. Um, so the New World Order is kind of the acknowledgement that the world is actually the world. The numbers are the numbers. The people are the people. Um, and through that, as we know in content, you know, it's about butts and seats. It's about the bottom line again, right? And the people paying are not the old school, you know, white male, right? White family. It's it's an eclectic group now. So to to that, that is the new world or acknowledging that the world is as such now. As far as you know, what the the company and I are doing in order to help, um, and I believe that was your question, right? How the company. Yes. Is- how do you see yourself in your NM88 uh, addressing and helping in this effort? I think that's that's just it. Is it's we're again minority owned and minority led, but we're also functioning at the level of the highest representation firms and studios. Um, I think to Kirk's point, and it's a very very valid one and an important one. It's about the next generation, right? In my industry. It hasn't been uh, an occupation that you know children of immigrants choose, right? So it's it's like my my immigrant Chinese parents weren't you know necessarily thrilled that I was going into the arts. Like what is that? It's not proven, right? Doctors are proven, lawyers are proven, uh, investment banking was starting to be proven, right? It's government, it's safe, it provides a paycheck and insurance. Um, what you're seeing now is that you know more and more. Uh, people of color are flooding into entertainment. Now, now it's about creating mentorship, right? All the things that the system has used in order to create this pipeline of the, if the so-called boys club, right? Mm-hmm. It's about what M88 and I are trying to do is one, show that if you're a minority, you can succeed on this level, right? And knock on wood, we continue to win. Two, you can come here, you have a home, we can train you. Right? It's not different than any other training. It's the best training. I was trained at the best firm for my entire career from the mail room up until senior partner, right? but paying it forward. And also, I think there are studies and, and everyone just knows feeling wise, it, it feels better when you're surrounded by people that have like experience, right? And when you're not the only person of color in a room, when you're actually surrounded by just diverse faces, I feel like you're creative juices and your your ability to speak your mind you just become more comfortable because you're not a quote-unquote outsider Mm. the company is is trying to do a lot of things um and and you know we're working so hard to make sure one again proving that we can win on this level two creating the pipeline for the next generation to come through and three you know, proving to the immigrant parents that this is an actual occupation that your kids can come to and, and, and win in uh, and, and be safe in. So um, that's what we're trying to do. It, it, so I hear you saying it's about creating legitimacy in some respects. Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah, great. And I would imagine that social media has really played an important role in all of this because it, it has given talent, whether it's talent on the field or talent the creative talent, a place to be more vocal 
uh, not just through formal mechanisms, which may have been less accessible, but now informally people can get their eyes, their ideas out anywhere, anytime. Yeah. Forever. I, I think for social media, for, for my business, and I know it for Kirk's too, it's just, look, the barrier to entry has always been, you know, in my, in my, uh, business is like, foreign value, 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 value. Like you can't get these roles. You can't be on these platforms. You can't do these things unless you have a certain value to the audience. And that value is built on, you know, people up top who may or may not look like us uh, making those decisions, right? What social media has allowed is there is no barrier to entry. You can just, you can speak your truth and you can, you can be creative on a platform that no one has to approve. And people, especially the younger generation, they'll find you. And they'd rather watch that versus what the system is kind of throwing down, you know, they're shoving down those roads. It's just like, this is a new way, like TikTok, Instagram Live, Snapchat, mm -hmm. like all of these things. It's, it's just, it's phenomenal. And it's really hard to keep up with all the platforms that allow creativity now from every, from every walk of life. Um, and the system now is starting to see that power just because the followers are just like audience members, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is allowing, again, giving the system a way to be like, to justify bringing more diverse voices in like, oh, they have this following or, oh, we can use her, him because right. <laughs> uh, these, these followers on Instagram, right? right. Mm -hmm. them numbers again, right? Um, which is what, you know, numbers again, don't lie. Right. So, so Kirk, I heard you amening. <laughs> what, 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 what do you want to say about that? No, I think Philip, he's right on. I mean, when you have a following, when you have um, people who are want to know what you're doing and what you're saying, that's something that I think companies uh, are aware of now because you're generating not only, I feel like, um, I guess, a genre that they never used before, right? Or the people who I've never contacted with before, that's what a lot. That's what's allowed social media to, I think, really take over, especially in sports. I mean, it's now people go to certain people's social media pages or feeds to do what to hear the response, whether it's current events or events that have happened in the past. I can get reaction right now from my favorite athlete, my favorite entertainer, my favorite singer, songwriter, whatever it may be. And that's what social media ha has been great because now I know that I can connect with that person. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's that that's for me. I, I laugh about it because it's it's also can be a curse sometimes because I see young kids who have a following at the age of 15, 16, 17 years old, and now they have expectations that are put on them, lofty expectations. And then they go into college or the professional ranks of a sport. And then now all of a sudden, if they don't reach those expectations that have been built up, they're considered a failure. And then they don't get those same calls that they were getting when they were the hot ticket, the hot item, right? But then also, and this kind of goes to uh, sort of the race and relations that we're all talking about too, is that you do get some of these young generation kids who are you know under the age of 18 that have a following but then they're also being looked upon by their peers to say something to stand for a message why aren't you protesting you need to be out doing something and that's unfair for some kids who don't like hey i'm still trying to figure things out just like you i'm trying to gain the information gain the knowledge on how to do it and I think that's the hard part or something, the difficult part that I see in so many young people with the social media is that, yeah, it can be good for your brand. But then also some people look at you as a voice of guidance. Mm -hmm. Like your brand is also my voice of God. What you're wearing or what you're saying, I want to be just like you. And that that's kind of goes down a slippery slope at times. Yeah. So I want to stay with you, Kirk, um, as as you and, and most people are aware Colin Kaepernick and other athletes have taken really courageous stances against right. racism. And in Colin's case, sacrificing right. his own career, while others have remained silent. 
What factors have reinforced that silence and what can be done to change that if you, in fact, believe it needs to be changed? Wow. I think we got to have the talk about it in context a little bit. And we go back to 2016 when Colin Kaepernick first started taking a knee. Right. Mm -hmm. It was also the year in which we were in a transition in terms of power uh, in our country. And we had a person who was running for president that was very outspoken and the things uh, outspoken on what we just talked about, social media. And he had a following on social media. And the things that Colin Kaepernick was believed in, what he talked about, and what he first knelt about, kneeled about, everyone was to a point where some people knew and other people didn't. And, you know, at the time, President Trump, who was uh, used that as a rallying cry for his campaign, use that as part of his, um, you know, his ongoing uh, uh, preach, uh, ongoing message to Americans that kneeling before the flag is so un-American. And all of that at, at the time in 2016, we had never seen a president act like that. Call a player or the NFL or sports leagues out for the actions of their players. And what did that do? That made NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, professional sports in general, kind of like, whoa, well, we don't want this. We don't need this PR nightmare. And so mm-hmm. players started to see that and like, do we want to go down the road of Colin Kaepernick and be outspoke, outspoken about what we believe in? Because at the time, when, if you're going to be outspoken about different, um, where if we're talking about just race or we're talking about police brutality, those messages at the time, you were sacrificing your career. We're talking about 15, 20, 20 plus years of work to achieve or to get to the highest level. I know for myself, I started playing football at the age of five. Okay. I got to the NFL at the age of 23. So kind of do the math, 18 years of my life was trying to get to the highest level of my profession. And to finally get there to the highest level that you've worked your entire life for, but you also have some thoughts on what's going on in the outside of the NFL bubble. And just your thoughts and your actions can cost 18 years for me, Mm -hmm. could have cost me my career. That's what Colin Kaepernick was showing us. I remember I was at his last game that he played in the NFL. I also work, you know, with the Los Angeles Rams and their radio network. And the, his last game was actually against the Los Angeles Rams. And, you know, here I am just trying to do my job. But yet I became overly emotional that day. I remember it like it was yesterday because Colin Kaepernick led the team to the to the victory, the San Francisco 49ers. And I kind of stood up and. I'm kind of overwhelmed with emotion because I saw him walking off the field and I knew it would be for the last time. I just Mm -hmm. knew because of where our country was at at that moment. Here's a man who believed in something, who wanted to make change, who wanted people who didn't have a voice to have a voice. And yet he gave up his career for that. And to watch him walk off the field, holding his fist in the air, uh, it was emotional because Not a lot of people would have done that. And he was able to do that. And I think now moving forward, what what he started back then is now acceptable now. It was not acceptable back in 2016 because of where our country was at. But if you want to talk about change that we've made in the last four years, Dean, you can see the change that we've made is that it's okay now. People are understanding. They're listening when they weren't before. And so that's what Colin Kaepernick started. And to see where we are now, totally different. Like guys now have the opportunity to speak. We talked about social media, but also different platforms. And before when people didn't listen, trust me, they're listening now. I actually wanted to follow up with you on that uh, because it, it feels like with the recent NFL apology for not honoring its players protests over racism, in, in recent years, right. that there's been this sort of rebranding of the organization. 
do you sense that there's been a power shift within the NFL between players and management as a result of maybe some of the legwork that Colin Kaepernick had started? Well, I won't say power shift. Um, <laughs> the owners still got the power, right? <laughs> They're still the ones cutting the checks. So I don't know if there's a, a, a power shift, but I will say this. Um, the one thing that I can say is that the, the way the league looks now and the faces of the franchises, the faces of the NFL, they don't look like they looked 10 years ago, five years ago. The last two most valuable players, right? The most valuable players considered the face of the NFL for that year. The last two most valuable players have been black men, Patrick Mahomes two years ago and Lamar Jackson this past season. So we're talking about Patrick Mahomes, age 25, Lamar Jackson, age 23. I got to tell everybody, these dudes ain't going nowhere, okay? They're not going nowhere. So you are going to continue to see faces like these, faces, men of color. And when you're the quarterback of a franchise in the NFL, you might as well be sitting right next to the owner because everyone knows your name. You are just as influential as that owner. And so it may not be a power struggle per se between owner and player, but I can definitely see that the owners realize how much they need to listen to their players and what can they do? Because before, what did everybody do? Or most companies would do what? Just throw some money, right? You cut a check and hopefully they'll be quiet. That's not the case anymore. Money's not going to shut people up. It's about action. And when you have players who are in the position like Mahomes and Jackson, who will be there for many, many years to come, it has went from just throwing money to no, we need action. And I think that's where the NFL is now heading. And you've seen it already with what they've been highlighting throughout this year. I mean, to start the, the season and having slogans such as end racism, unity, we're in this together. The NFL wasn't doing that two years ago, 10 years ago, 15. It has now changed because its players have forced them to change. Yeah. So let, just for the audience's awareness, in about uh, five minutes or so, we're going to be going to audience questions. So if you haven't already submitted some, please do so. And uh, Professor Reed is, is going to be moderating that section shortly. So Philip, let's bring this back to the artistic community. We now live in a post-Hamilton world where diverse casting has become an expectation for many consumers. As audiences seek more equitable representation across the entertainment platforms, will Hollywood be able to keep up with, with the demand? I, Are I, they ready for it? I think I think the, the, the demand is just too high. They're not gonna they're not gonna be not they're not gonna stand in the way of it. Um, again, I think before it had come down to in the movie space when when movies were dominant, theatrical releases were dominant. Um, it all came down to kind of international value. Like there are so many different excuses for why people of color weren't in lead roles, you know, diverse casting, et cetera. Now it's with the, the golden age of television, right? Where, where those, again, entries to, to or bears to entry for people of color in lead roles is less because TV, TV uh, stations, networks, streaming services, they don't care about international value. It's about subscribers, right? So it takes a bit of pressure off on who they can cast. Um, I think there's just, again, to your question, it's just, there's just such a demand now. Um, and there are also, you know, again, Kirk and I keep saying this, the pipeline and kind of the future generations, like people are coming up and, and people of color are flooding again in the creative space and they're writing stories for themselves. They're writing stories for their cultures. They're writing stories for their communities. And, you know, the system's not trying to not keep up. It's just a slow burn, right? It's, it's, there are moments in time, like, you know, the perfect tragedy of George Floyd, where it's like, there are moments in time where you can take, in Kirk's terms, like 10 yards, right? Versus two, right? Like, there's a natural grind of progression. But in this moment, take 10. Right. Everyone's got to lean. In. I think that it also ties up to, you know, what Kirk was saying about the NFL. Like it, it's in my industry, too. People are starting to link together. People are starting to to join arms. You know, I joined my my mentor, who's, you know, the first black partner at WME. I could have gone anywhere 
right? Any company to be that person, or I could have put my money where my mouth is and joined forces with another minority, right? To show power together, right? I think that, you know, that's what the players are doing, right? I've seen commercials now where they actually, like when Drew Brees came out, his entire team came after him, but also other players came after him, right? It was like, there, enough is enough with that. There is a unity, uh, unity feeling now. Um, and that will push diverse casting forward as well because, you know, Michael, Idris, the clients that I'm blessed to work with, they're going to be shot from the rooftops. Anything they're producing, you better have people that look like, you know, the, the actual characters playing them, right? Yeah. You, you'll see that in the black community, the Asian community, Latino, Latinx, LGBTQ+. Like, it's, it's for the first time feeling like people are really seeing each other. And instead of being like, I got to get mine, there's one seat at the table. Right. They're like, we're going to build our own table. Right. Everyone come. And for the first time, it feels like in multiple industries, people are actually doing so. And that will lead to my industry trying to keep up, needing to keep up. And, the, and I believe that they will keep up. Yeah. So, Kirk, last question before we turn it over to the Q&A from the audience. At the end of the day, fans want to watch their teams and their favorite players compete in the sport that they love. What would you tell fans who might say politics don't belong in football? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> it's it's basically uh, what was I said before. I think to LeBron James, right? Shut up and dribble. Uh, mm -hmm. Go do what you do, and don't worry about this over here. I think the hard part people have to realize um, is that, and fans have to realize this: you can watch me in a sport. You can watch me on television. You can watch me in entertainment, whatever it may be. But when I get done, when I'm done playing the game and I get in my car and, and drive home, I am just like you. The same issues that you see going on in your community, in your neighborhood, I live that too. I'm not immune to that. And it's hard for me to turn a blind eye to that, especially a, a lot of athletes who a lot of people look to them for guidance and look to them for a message where here they go from playing a sport and all of a sudden they get home and it's hard to ignore what's going on. It's hard to ignore the fear that, you know, I still feel at times when you drive home and knowing that I can be mistaken or a cop pulls me over for having a bad day and decides to, well, you fit the description. Like that stuff is that that's that's politics that and I can't ignore what's going on with that police brutality. It's happening in our country. How do you stop that or how do you not want to talk about that or how could I fix that? That That's where I think the the people who will say, hey, it, politics and sports don't don't mix. They, they actually do. They do. And that's the reason why you saw it in this past election. The NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball made their players. They didn't make their players. I shouldn't say made. Their players went out and voted. They got guys to go out and make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do and invoking the change and voting, exercising our right. So, yes, we understand that politics and sports, they are always intertwined. I don't care what you, how you think it's not, but it is. And I think that the biggest part... And I can, I can leave you with this one. Michael Jordan is probably the greatest athlete to ever live. I think we all know who Michael Jordan is. He's actually one of 92 owners in the Major League Baseball, basketball, NFL. He's the only black owner in professional sports in North America. The big, the big three, I should say, NBA, baseball, and basketball, and, and football. He is the number, he is the only black majority owner. But as a player, remember people wanted him to get into politics. And he says, I remember he said, what do you say? Um, <laughs> Republicans buy sneakers too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> remember, Republicans buy sneakers too. And everybody, he took a lot of heat for that. But that was as a player. But now Michael Jordan, the owner, totally different. He's had an awakening. He realizes the power that he has being a majority owner of a professional franchise in sports. And so 
to me, he's shown that, yeah, politics and sports, we're intertwined. It ain't about the Republicans. It ain't about the Democrats. We in it together. And if Michael Jordan can do that, trust me, yeah, I know politics and sports are like this now. They're, they're, not, they're not separate. Well, thank you both. Fascinating to talk with you. Let me bring in my colleague, Professor Americus Reed, Reed, to share with us what's happening from the audience. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dean Jeans. I really appreciate you. And uh, this is a fantastic conversation. Uh, and I want to jump right in, Philip and, and Kirk, because we've got a lot of questions that are coming in uh, from our audience uh, today. Um, I mean, I, you know, a, a very interesting quote I once heard was that diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance, and equity is being able to ask the DJ to play the song you want. And so, <laughs> it's an interesting question from Christian uh, asks as we speak about marketing and how we work to develop knowledge of our personal brands to become more elevated. Uh, how, how do how do we elevate minorities and people of color uh, to feel more equal and more a part of? Uh, this conversation and, and activity and not just a member at the table? Um, I, I know I can, I'll start with this one first, Philip. Um, yeah. I know that one thing that I do with uh, the platform that I have is to do what? To try to make sure I'm getting the word out. I'm getting the message out. I mean, I think that's, that's the first part, right? I think I've been in meetings and production meetings and um, to where sometimes you kind of were quiet or you did throw an idea out, many people didn't listen. I think that's totally, that's not the case anymore. People are now listening. And so when you talk about brands, it's about making sure that you use your platform to put that, push that brand, to let everybody know, hey, this is also out there. This is also something that we should take a look at. Because if you have that space, why not talk about it? And I know that's what we've been doing at the for, for, for Progress on SiriusXM is giving people uh, the opportunity that may not have had that opportunity before. Like, I, I'll just go, there's a brand now, and, and I may be giving them a little love here, but it's, it's called Black Girl Hockey Magic. And I had no idea what that was about two months ago, but it's about Black women who actually love hockey, which is a sport that's not primarily African-American, but yet they feel like they want to be included. And so now with the platform that you use, I want to push that to let people know, hey, there's also room for people who like hockey. You can go here. And here's a group that's doing that. That's how you push the brand. That's how you mark. It's about hopefully having everyone use their platforms and get the word out, get the message out. Excellent. Thoughts, Philip? Yeah, I just piggyback on, on top of that. I mean, Kirsten did perfectly. I think you use your platform to educate, right? And promote. I also think it goes back to, you know, more platforms will be created mm. when we support each other, yes. right? You build the pipeline and create platforms for for the next, right? Um, we like to say like if there's a there's not one to the table, and if there is, just go build your own table for everyone to sit and eat, right? Right. Um, I think that that is to Kirk's point, right? The the best way to market all of us. It's look. Some of us are lucky and have grinded and have gotten to this position where we have platform, just pay it forward and, and pay it to the next. Excellent point. Let me get you guys' thoughts on this because I, I think it's an interesting dynamic that's going on here, uh, especially in sports, uh, Kirk, and, and also in entertainment. And that is the idea that th the more that one brings the one's personal brand into a conversation as a, as a component of, of an activist kind of uh, motivational impetus, the, 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 there's the possibility that there's a tension around alienating some people, right? So, it, right. and I want to get your thoughts on this because I think the elephant in the room is that we clearly saw, I think, as a function of the election is that th this idea that there are kind of two different Americas, right? There's just, right. There, there's there's this America that we're speaking of in, in this conversation as well, but there's a different America that's out there that has different perspectives and a totally different viewpoint. So how do we, what do we do about that? How as, as, as brands as sports and entertainment, and as we're bringing race to the forefront in conversations like, like these, like what, how do we address that issue? How do we address what we should do with this other side? 
Wow, that's that's <laughs> that's, that's that's a tough one. Uh, it really is because you know it's just like um, you know me and you right now, right? Just say we're going out to dinner. You want to go to a certain place. I want to go to a certain place. How do we come together and compromise? Right? What's the compromise? Like you know what? How about we go to my place first, and then next time you go to your place, right? It's 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 that's where. I think the compromise has to come within for others to listen and to want to listen. That's the hard part is that people are saying, no, I'm right. This is the best place to go and we should go here. And if you don't want to go to my place, I'm not going at all. And that shouldn't be the case. Right. And so I think it will take time because you can't be so upset that one side is going to have their way and the other side won't. It's OK. Let me start to look at things from their side first. I think that's what the what, what people don't like to do. It's either my way or the highway when let me try to put myself in their shoes for a minute. Right. I don't care if you're on the left, you're on the right. Let's it's about understanding. And it, that's it's a difficult it's a difficult question. It really is, because it takes more for people to listen and understand and want to change more so than, hey, this is what you have to do. Like, excuse me, sir, you have to do this. Because some people, you know, they're just caught up in their ways, right? You know, my parents, they don't want to go into the new tech world that we're in in 2020. They still want to use a landline. I'm like, who still uses a landline? You know, it's, it's those <laughs> kinds of things that, you know, that our country is going through. But if you don't accept change, then honestly, that's that's what makes you uh, get, get, you know, get left behind. Let me push on that point, Philip. Is there a middle ground? I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, you know what? Uh, you like thin crust and I like deep dish. <laughs> it's another thing to say that I believe the reason why you like thin crust is because you're an evil person. Mm, right. And, and so how yeah. do we how do we get there, Philip? And then, and then back to Kurt. How do we what do we do? What can we collectively do to start creating that framework where we can move to a different a, a middle ground that, that we can foresee? Look, I think I think. I think you have to define middle ground, right? It's, 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 I think it's different for everyone, right? I think as far as the responsibilities that people with brands or platform have in this very tumultuous time is, look, we, we have to find an understanding, right? And if you require, like, people, it goes back to the, the just uh, shut up and dribble, right? Here's the thing. Athletes. They're public figures, okay? They have a responsibility, given the followers, in my personal opinion, to speak their truth. Correct. They also have a responsibility, given that people are buying their sneakers and buying their jerseys, to be thoughtful of it, right? right. Thoughtful with it, right? And I think that that's something that athletes might not agree with, right? Like, fully. Right. Like, like I can speak my mind. I'm me, right? But, you know, with it's like a Spider-Man quote. With power comes responsibility, right? Yeah. It's it's literally people with, let's just say, power, right? They have a responsibility to, as you said, Kurt, figure out what the other side is feeling, right? It's right. all about feeling. It's not necessarily about a middle ground. It's about if they feel there's a middle ground, yeah. right? That's, it's, it's a different thing. It's not finite. It's like, you know, it's, a, it's an emotion, mm -hmm. right? So, and without, when you get, to get, get someone to open the door just slightly, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can start educating, right? Yeah. To, my, to the Michael Jordan example, Republicans <laughs> buy sneakers, right? Yeah. We're a capitalist society, right? We want to find the middle. We want to educate the other side, if you, let's call them the other side, if you will, right? And be like, this is why our culture is great. This is why this brand is great, right? right. Doesn't mean you can't have your brand. It just I just want you to know why this one's great. And I'm going to reach across also and understand why you think your brand is great. Right. And if the middle ground is, well, I don't hate that guy. I still don't like his brand, but I don't hate him. Right. I think that's what we achieve as step one. <laughs> and, <Right>. and, and, <laughs> and other things. But it, it's, it, it's kind of getting, you know, just being from Southern Virginia and like DC being in my backyard, it's people are feeling hatred. People yes. are feeling alienated. People are feeling like they don't want to talk to the other side. Right. I think as adults, we need to figure out how to make people feel a bit better, not take away, 
just right. feel like, yo, I see you, right? You, I hope you see me, right? Let's figure out how, how that site can be seen, right? And right. then we'll, start, we'll talk about everything else. But I think that there are so many steps before we yeah. get to the other everything else. It's about making everyone feel unified again. Interesting. Kurt, let me ask you a question related to this notion of, of activism in sports. Right. What is your advice for those athletes that are not the LeBrons of the world, that don't have the $150 million shoe deal, right. and they are just kind of the journeymen, and they're just trying to, to, to do their thing? Uh, what, how, do you, how would you advise them on getting involved in these kinds of social activist activities and in context of their personal brands on social media, because one would imagine that there's more perhaps risk for these players than say the top names that we all know. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think I was that I was once that athlete. I was that guy that I was trying to find like, how do I, I don't have that name of the more prominent athlete, but how can I make change? Right. How can I help out? you know, fight the cause. And a lot of it is really right there within your own community. It's really about what can I do around me? What can I, um, who can I talk to? A lot of times it's about finding a mentor, right? That's what I see from a lot of young people is that so many people want to help and they're like, but where do I start? Like, what do I do? Like, I, I want to protest and I want to do this. And, I, and they have this energy and you start with, OK, what am I good at first? I'm good at, you know what? I'm good with words. You know what? I want to write. So maybe it could be in starting a blog post. Maybe it could be starting uh, a journal, whatever it may be, and just give it to people. Someone will read it. And I think what happens is a lot of times is people feel like you have to change doesn't mean you're affecting 30,000, a million, two million. Change could be just affecting one person. If you change one person's life, you've done your job. And so that's why I feel that you start small and work your way up and you get bigger and bigger. That's what the dreams and aspirations were. I didn't always dream that I was going to be where I'm at right now. It was let me start this and make a goal for myself and then continue on with that goal. I think that's what, you know, some athletes can do and, and then find the platform that works for you as well. I mean, we, we keep talking about the platform, but it is true. Why not go to your local radio station, your local television station, you know, the, the, the local people around and say, hey, I have an idea. Can can you help me with this? Or I would like to pitch you something. It's OK to do that now. And that's where the athletes who I know who I work with, um, that's what they continue to do. They continue to say, let me start with my own community first. Mm -hmm. And then as I go from there that people will see the good works and the good deeds that you're doing. Trust me. But when you, you try to do too much, that's mm -hmm. where I feel that it kind of gets lost. I'd rather put all my effort into one than trying to spread it thin over 10, 15 different other you know, agendas. Interesting. We have about time for one more question, gentlemen. I, I want to sort of throw this out to both of you guys. Uh, this is a question from Steve Phillip. Um, and this has to do with the biggest piece of advice that you have for individuals who are pushing for stronger uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in their organizations in terms of things you've seen there yourself. And then the final question, which I think is super fascinating from Reginald Regulus, what can we do to facilitate long-term systematic change and what, will, what should we ask our white male allies to do in that context of facilitation of change? I jumping on that last one. Um, yeah. To, for long-term and also just you know, to the first question, Stephen's question too. You can ask your your uh, your white counterparts who are in the smallest rooms to put someone who looks like us, who is ready for it and experienced enough and deserving to be there, in those smallest rooms. Everything else in in my experience has been a program, uh, a, something symbolic, right? As we spoke about before, when people of color, women, people of color, and allies are in the smallest room, systemic change happens, yeah. right? Everything else, like that's why we all have to grind and support each other and lift each other up in yeah. whatever division and, and like industry that we're in. It's because one of us up in the smallest room, in the C-suite if you call it, right? Mm -hmm. Affects more change than 20 of us playing on the field. Right. 
right? That's it. You, you have one Michael Jordan who really leans in. Correct. Things start happening, right? But until there's more of us in those C-suites, right? And it's not scrapping to get there, pushing each other down to get there. It's let's get there together, right? When there are more of us there, there will be systemic change. Uh, uh, certainly in my industry. Decisions on content, decisions on what content matters, uh, dis- decisions on which creators get hired, all changes with the boss. And if the boss starts looking like us, I think the, the world, at, le- at least in my world, it will, it will start changing too. Yeah, I, I agree totally with that. Everything you said, Philip, because um, a lot of it, to me, it, it goes back also to understanding that you, to my, he said to our white counterparts, right? I would just say listening. Like I've had more conversations in the last three, four months with executives from my different companies I work for than I ever had before, because a lot of them just wanted to listen and understand. And just hear my thoughts. Just literally, just Kurt, just talk to me. Just tell me. Because that's what I mentioned before. And I've been okay with their answers and saying that I've been in my own bubble of taking care of my family, wife, kids, work, vacation, like doing what you do. And you're such a routine. And then COVID hit, the pandemic hit, and it t- made us put our just put more perspective about life, of what's really important to us. And it's about what's going on in other people's lives as well. And you realize just how common we really are. Like, man, okay, you're going through that, I'm going through that too. And so the more and more I think others listen, have that conversation, but also too, you gotta do your research, do your homework. You say, what bit of advice would I give I would force people to go out there, do their research, do their homework. I know I have to as well in many different things that I do within my life. And I feel more comfortable about having these conversations when I do know the research and I do have the facts, but also to be able to be humble enough to listen to your opinion and not feel like we're battling. We're going against each other. That's the back and forth is that, look, whatever your opinion is, whatever my opinion is, I'm still going to love you after it. And we're still going to be able to be friends. We can have those conversations. But I think that's what moving forward, it has to be. And always, I think I always live by this. I want to leave it better for the next person that comes after me. I don't want to leave it worse. That's right. Excellent. I'm going to turn it back over to Dean James. Thanks, boss. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, be involved in such a very interesting beginning to a great conversation. Well, and... Professor Reed, thank you. Uh, so glad that you brought your expertise to help moderate this thank conversation. <laughs> and Philip and Kirk, really, the fact that you shared your time with the Wharton School and with our audience and your important perspective on two really fascinating industries has just been wonderful. So thank you, Bo. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, all three of you. So while this concludes our three-part race dialogue, mm-hmm. The Beyond Business series is an ongoing discussion that I look forward to continuing in the new year where our focus will be on climate change. So until then, thank you all and we'll see you in 2021.